You're listening to the Option Alpha podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again at OptionAlpha.com working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered online because it's based on one thing and one thing only, and that's helping you guys make smarter trades. So thank you so much again for tuning in today. On today's show, we're going to be talking about leveraged and inverse ETFs and how you might end up changing some of your option strategies if you decide to start jumping into some of these ponds and uh, trading these vehicles or products because I think it's really important that you understand, you know, kind of how they work before you start doing that. So let's get right into it. First of all, I want to point you to two resources, which I think will be helpful as you go through today's lesson and then also maybe some additional stuff in the topic. And that's show number 27. Yes, I know this is show number 86, which is crazy, but 27, way, way, way back when we first started, we talked in depth about how inverse ETFs are priced and how leverage ETFs are priced. We're going to be touching on a little bit of that again here today, but that episode is, again, just like fully chalk, like chalk full of that, like whole pricing model and structure. And then episode number 68, which is where we brought on Mark Sebastian about trading volatility. That was a really good one about just VIC term structure, et cetera. So if you want to learn more about VIX today, then I would suggest you go over and listen to show number 68. So here's really the three things that I have to say about changing option strategies around inverse and leverage ETFs. Number one is that you've got to remember that inverse leverage ETFs have what's called pricing drag, basically. And that is that if you are trading an inverse ETF like FAZ or something like that, right, which is a three times inverse ETF or a a, a double ETF, something like that. You have to understand that they have what's called basically like pricing drag. And that, that's what I call is pricing drag. They end up dragging lower because they're based on percentage changes, not necessarily tracking dollar changes. So for example, if the index that something is tracking, and maybe it's an inverse one-to-one ratio, if the market goes up by 1%, this ETF is going to go down by 1%. And that all sounds good until you get to the next day, right? Because if the market goes up by 1%, and then goes down by 1%, right? It's theoretically back at the same level, though it's a little bit higher because of interest, right? Or the the margin, the differential. But the ETF that went down by 1% is now starting at a lower level and is going to climb by 1%. It's not going to make up that difference between the ETF and the index. So what you have is you have this just growing disparity between what the ETF or inverse ETF's price is and what it should be had you just flat out sold or short sold the index or ETF that you're trading, right? So it took a bearish position on it versus using the inverse ETF. So I think that's the biggest thing that you just have to understand in relation to trading these things. So a great example is if you want to type it in and look it up is FAZ. And this is a three times bearish ETF on financials. And so this thing just has like an incredible negative drag. I mean, it just looks like the stock chart is just a one-way directional highway to the ground, right? And a lot of times they end up repricing these and they do in splits on these things just to reset the price higher so that they can drag lower for the next two or three years, right? So that's the biggest thing you have to understand about these options. Now, when it comes to stuff that is not necessarily inverse, but also tracks like futures, like VXX is a really popular one. You have to remember that in this case, like VXX, which is a really popular one for people to trade, VXX loses money every single month because it's always trying to track a 30-day future contract on the VIX. And so what ends up happening is it ends up buying futures for a greater price than it sells. And that difference or that basically that pricing structure ends up again dragging VXX lower, whereas VIX, what it's really supposed to be tracking is basically staying the same or staying range bound or you know has a floor to it to a sense right so you just have to really dig into some of these and just understand their structure how they're priced how they move in relation to whatever you're trading and this really goes in the opposite direction too with things that are you know like three times bullish or leverage bullish or inverse you know to the bullish side so it all works in the same you know kind of mechanics and structure just in opposite directions 
So the first thing is understand the drag in pricing. The second thing is I would say if you're trading options around these is just to use a shorter duration or trading period. So the whole idea behind this is that as you understand that the pricing gets worse every single day that you're in it, right? So this pricing differential on inverse ETFs starts to compound on top of itself. The disparity or the spread between them becomes wider between what it's actually trading and what the ETF price is. Then that means that you are best served to keep your trading timeline really short. A week, two weeks, right? Maybe a month out, you know, if something, you know, you really want to protect something further out, right? But really try to keep that, that duration really tight because that's when you're going to be able to take advantage of maybe a quick move in one of these things and basically, you know, cover a position or make some money in a position, but it'll be a quick move and you won't have to hold that position for a long time where this, you know, kind of pricing disparity and structure just eats away at your premium. It's kind of like time decay in a sense that, you know, time decay will be eating away at these premiums, but just like the pricing structure on these inverse ETFs just ends up really killing you long term. The third thing that we're going to talk about is that they're mainly used for hedging. So many of you know, if you're part of the membership here at Option Alpha, that we rarely, rarely trade any inverse ETFs or leveraged ETFs because of what we just talked about now, because it's really hard to do them. And you would think that it's actually easy to do them in the direction that they're moving, but it's not because the markets know that they're, you know, priced that way. So they adjust pricing around options the same, you know, in the same vein, right? So the reality is, is that it's not as surefire bet as you would think it is to just trade VXX lower or trade FAZ lower because it's always going to have that negative pricing drag. The market knows that. The market's smart. It realizes that that drag is lower and so it adjusts the options accordingly, right? And the same thing why, you know, when you see VIX options, VIX options have really weird pricing sometimes because it's always based on the fact that the market knows that implied volatility will be higher in the future or if we have a big spike in the VIX we know that implied volatility will eventually calm down. That's all priced in the future structure of the VIX, right? So we know that here as options traders. So my suggestion to you guys is that if you're going to use options around these, please use them mainly for hedging purposes and then realize that you don't need to do a lot of contracts to hedge your position, right? Especially if you're doing a double leveraged or a 3x leveraged position, Ideally, if something really crazy is going to happen in a couple days or a week, then get into a small position in that if you want to. Again, I do not do this. I'm just full disclosure. I just don't do this. But if you want to, you can. I understand why people want to do it. Get into a small position and use it to hedge something else, just realizing that it can move very quickly and you don't need a lot of contracts to hedge, right? Because a 3x you know, inverse ETF can hedge three times as many of something other, some other position that you have in your portfolio. Okay. So treat it like insurance. It really is insurance. That's how it basically pays out, right? That's the best way to use it. Another way that we use it and just like full disclosure, I think we talked about this on show 68 with Mark as a great trading strategy. And that is when things like FAS, FAZ and VXX, when they pop, when they move against their overall trend that they should be in, which is like this negative drag in pricing lower, when they do pop higher, that might be an opportunity to sell some options on them or to go bearish on them because the long-term outlook is that the longer you hold them in that instance, right, because it's popped higher, it's had a quick little spike, that you're going to take advantage of that pricing structure over the next 30 or 45 days, right? So that would be the only time where I would actually trade them for a profit and actually Trading VXX is one of the most profitable trades that we do. It just, it doesn't always pop higher, right? That's the problem with it is that maybe it happens once or twice a year. And when it does, I mean, we're in there with a bunch of contracts, a bunch of different positions, trying to trade it as much as possible when it pops higher because that's that opportunity to kind of trade that term structure, that pricing structure, that drag lower, but it just doesn't happen all that often. So that's the only thing I could say about those. We don't trade them for the vast majority of the time here at Option Alpha. It's just not what we do. It doesn't generate a lot of income for us. But when given the opportunity, we will use them for hedging purposes, either like on a Fed announcement or on a Brexit type situation. That's something that we talked about with elite members during Brexit way back when, if you guys remember when Brexit was happening. So those would be instances where you might want to hedge with a couple contracts just to kind of curve the edges, right? Just to reduce a little bit of that tail end risk in case things go really, really crazy. 
And now our favorite part of the show, Trader Q&A, where we ask a question from one of our current members about options trading. Got a question you'd like to ask Kirk to answer live on the air? Just head on over to optionalpha.com forward slash ask and hit the record button to leave a message. That's optionalpha.com forward slash ask. And now, here's today's question. Hi, Kirk. This is June from somewhere near Thailand. I have a question about call debit spread. I bought a Tesla February 230. 235 call debit spread when Tesla was around 227 a couple of days ago. Now, Tesla has traded past 235, but my debit spread is only about $50 in profit. Hmm, not a good reward for being right for once. Please tell me how I can make the most out of this trade. Thank you. All right. Hey, June, thank you so much for submitting the question. And so great to have some more international questions coming in here to the podcast, which is fantastic. So the setup that you had in Tesla was basically that you bought an out of the money call debit spread in Tesla. When Tesla was trading around 227, you bought the 230, 235 call spread. And now Tesla's trading above 235, which is great, or at least at the time that you you know sent this recording to me. And that's awesome, right? So you got the direction right. And I think that's probably why you're frustrated that it just didn't work out on the option side. The reality is, though, is that your options probably had right a longer duration at that time period, right? And so they had a lot of time until expiration. And so when you buy options that have time until expiration, especially a spread, that spread moves slowly. So the pricing moves slowly. In fact, it kind of accelerates as we get closer to expiration with time decay and volatility coming out of it. But what you're seeing the effect on is that you got a early move in the stock and that's not reflected as much as you'd like in the pricing of the option spread because that spread has so much time left. The stock could reverse. So the options are moving in price. It's just that the differential between the two months is not that great because there's still a lot of time left. There's still a lot of volatility priced in, so you don't get that. Now, if the stock were to stay here, just for full disclosure, let's say that Tesla just stops trading and just stays totally flat at 235, so above your strike prices, then every single day you'd get a net credit in your account from time decay and volatility decay. So as you get closer to expiration, now your profit goes from $50 to say 55 and then 60, 65, 70, et cetera. It just starts growing every day because now the pricing between the two different strike uh, options is now starting to decay and the real true value is starting to reveal itself. Basically that there is a $5 difference. But I always tell people with debit spreads is that debit spreads are great for this fact because they give you more time to be right. But when you're right early, it kind of stinks. I mean, like there's no doubt about it, right? Debit spreads are great to trade longer. You want to buy as much time as you can get because it's fairly cheap and they don't move too often, right? So you get a lot of time to be right. But if you get an early move in the stock like this, then it ends up, you know, kind of not necessarily shooting yourself in the foot because you still make money on it, but it's not as great as what you thought it would be at the end of the day. So hopefully that helps out. Again, if you want to get your question answered here on the podcast or live on Facebook and Periscope, which I've already started doing and people really enjoy. So if you haven't joined our Facebook community, please head on over there on Periscope too. We're starting to do YouTube lives. It's been a lot of fun. I like, like doing it, like interacting with people, getting a lot of social engagement, which is very cool. Please head on over to opshalpha.com slash ask. Click the big red button in the middle of the screen and leave me a private voicemail. Remember, there's no software to download or install. It's incredibly easy. You can do it on your phone or your desktop, whatever. But go over there and get that question into us so we can get it onto the next podcast or Facebook Live. Now, before we get into the closing bell segment, like I mentioned last week, we've been basically putting up on the website in chunks or blocks like 20, 30, 50 videos at a time of live trades that I've been doing. So if you haven't been over to the live trading section, we are always adding new content to that section. But basically what that section is, is just me recording my screen as I go through different trading scenarios. So opening trades, closing trades, adjusting trades all kinds of different ETFs, all kinds of profit scenarios, some winners, some losers. I mean, like we basically are just putting it out there so that you can see what we're doing in real time as we're doing it. So if you haven't been over to the website yet, please head on over there. Again, it's under the education tab and then just click on live trades. Now, the closing bell. Find out which stocks we're looking at right now, trades we're making, and hear our game plan moving forward. Moving forward.
All right, so in today's closing bell segment, we're going to talk about a new Iron Butterfly trade that we got into in XRT. So we got into this trade. This is basically another laddered set of Iron Butterflies that we planned on getting into in XRT. This one is centered around the 41 strike. So right now, at the time that we're actually doing this, XRT is trading just above like 41 and a half. So we really have to pick either the 42s or the 41s. Now, XRT has been on a little bit of a down move, right? Implied volatility is spiked up. That's all been great. Gives us an opportunity to sell some good premium at, you know, kind of richer levels than usual. But we have to pick a direction here. We got to pick either the 41s or the 42s just to be a little bit bearish or a little bit bullish. So with FXE, I'm sorry, with XRT trading a little bit above 41 and a half, we're going to pick the 41 strikes that centers our iron butterfly just slightly below where the stock is trading right now. Now from there, we're gonna go ahead and buy options out on either end $5. So we're gonna buy the 46 calls and then buy the 36 puts. Now those options, the reason that we chose those is because $5 is just a good starting basis, usually for stocks that are you know in this range. We could have easily gone $6 out or $7 out, but here's the thing on this one, this is what I really wanna drive home in this podcast today, is that those 46 calls and 36 puts are worth respectively $9 and $6 each. Once you start going further out than 46 on the call side and 36 on the put side, you're only saving $1 for every strike price basically that you go further out. So if you think about it like this, and this is hopefully the common sense aspect that we're trying to get across here, is that if we go out one more strike and make our iron butterfly one more strike wider on each side, we're taking on a full dollar of risk or $100 of risk to potentially save in pricing two bucks, right? It just doesn't make sense at that point. There's a point at which going so far out on these iron butterflies just doesn't make sense. So just have a little bit of logic in this. I mean, like sometimes what I end up doing is, you know, go somewhere around like 10 bucks, right? As like a target, right? Sometimes it'll be more. Maybe we'll buy some on a bigger priced, you know, stock that's maybe $15 or $20, but as a general target like 10 bucks might be good, right? Start $5 out, then start looking at it logically, right? How much money do you actually get in credit for going for that additional $100 of risk? And if you're only getting $2 of potential credit, it's not worth doing, right? It's just not worth doing. So that's why we did the $5 wide spread in this case with XRT. So the hope is since there's about 44 days to go till expiration, these are April contracts, that XRT kind of stays range bound here for a little bit, or we get a drop in implied volatility, which I think we should get, you know, maybe heading into March expiration. Once we get that, just even a little drop in implied volatility, we'll be out of this right at our 25% profit target. So we're taking in a big credit of $220, trying to take this thing off pretty quickly once it's decayed in value by 25%. So we're not going to hold it all the way to expiration. And hey, who knows, we might even leg out of this position like we talked about in the previous episode in show number 85, how we did with FXE. That's definitely something that we might do because those long options are really not worth that much money now. And if it decays in value overall, I bet you those long options probably will be worth one or two dollars a piece. So we might just leave those on and have them act as little lottery tickets or you know protection against tail risk heading into the April expiration. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything. Free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right, so I truly hope you guys enjoyed today's episode and got at least one thing out of it that you can apply right now to make you a smarter more profitable trader and investor. As always, you can get additional resources, links mentioned in the show, and some related video training by going to optionalpha.com slash show 86. Again, that's just the number 86, optionalpha.com slash show 86. Until the next time, happy trading.